Now for the last several months, I was involved in writing a paper on this passage, and I thought it might be good to look at it uh, this morning and just kind of share with you all some of the time that I've spent studying this. Uh, and if you would open your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 25, we're going to look at the story of Nabal and Abigail this morning. Uh, the story of Nabal and Abigail, in many ways an important uh, lesson, but in order to understand it, we really need to understand the context of the entire book of Samuel. Of course, First and Second Samuel were originally one book. Uh, the Hebrews considered them one book. Uh, they got divided into two later on for practical reasons, probably because you know, you know, simply because it wouldn't fit on the scroll. Uh, but the main story of First Samuel centers around three major characters: Samuel, Saul, and David. And of course, it starts with Samuel himself, I guess. That's why the book bears his name. And Samuel was a prophet of God. In his youth, he was called upon by the voice of God, and he spoke many words. It was rare that people had a vision from the Lord in those days, but Samuel had them. And Samuel judged the people of Israel for many, many years. But in Samuel's old age, the people realized that Samuel's sons were not fit to judge the people. They were not fit to lead. And so the people demanded a king from Samuel. They said, give us a king to fight our battles for us and to lead us out and to make us like all of the other nations around us. Well, Samuel was greatly distressed at this request, but God told him to grant the people's request, saying that they have not, been re they have not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me from being king over them. And so Samuel was led to Saul. And Saul was in the mind of the, in the secular mind everything a king should be. He was tall, he was powerful, he was head and shoulders above all of the rest of the people. He was certainly fit to lead them out to battle and to fight their battles. And of course the early story of Saul is filled with considerable success actually. Saul goes out uh, against the Ammonites when they're about to sack the city of Jabesh Gilead and gouge out the right eye of every inhabitant. And Saul saves that city. He rallies the forces of Israel together and they accomplish a great victory. But Saul's initial success quickly turns to failure. Whenever Saul disobeys God, whenever Saul fails to wait for Samuel to offer the sacrifice before battle, and upon that occasion, Samuel told Saul that his disobedience had led to him being rejected as king and that God would seek out a man after his own heart to replace him. Later on, when God sent Saul out to destroy the Amalekites, utterly destroy them, and Saul failed to carry out the command of the Lord, instead sparing some of the livestock and sparing Agag, the king, well, Saul insisted over and over that he had fulfilled the commandment of the Lord. And then he made excuses, saying that the people, they were the ones that wanted to spare the animals for sacrifice. Samuel on that occasion says, Does the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings as he does in obedience? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of divination. And so Saul was rejected as king because of his disobedience to God's will. Because of his failure to repent upon being confronted with his sin. It was only after Samuel had said that God has rejected you from being king that Saul then said, oh wait, 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 I'm sorry. You know, I have sinned. You know, now when there's a real consequence, then all of a sudden Saul is, becomes personally invested in owning up to his sin, whatever he can do to maintain his position. God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint one of Jesse's sons. But God gave Samuel some pretty clear instructions as to how he would choose the king from Jesse's house. God would not choose the one that Samuel expected. In 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, the text says, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Speaking about Eliab, Jesse's firstborn son. For God sees not as man sees. The man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the king that God chose was not present among Jesse's seven sons that were there. He was not the imposing, tall leader like Saul had been. Rather, God chose David, the youngest, who was off in the wilderness tending the sheep. 
Samuel anointed David on that occasion, and the Spirit of God came upon David from that day onward in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 13. But David's path to kingship didn't happen overnight. You know, it wasn't like Samuel anointed David and the next day David gets to sit on the throne and Saul's just out of there. Well, no, Saul's still on the throne. Saul still has some clout with the people of Israel. David's journey to the kingship was a long and difficult one, fraught with testing, challenge. And this act of anointing David as king created a conflict between the house of David and the house of Saul, one that persists until the end of the book of 1 Samuel, and even in some ways afterwards, whenever the house of Saul continues to try to hold on to what little it has left. And key to this conflict is this David's famous battle with the giant Goliath. You know, we always think of that story in terms of David versus Goliath. But the story behind the story is really David against Saul. Because Goliath, the great Philistine champion, mighty and powerful as he was, comes out to the people and challenges, those men, challenges them and says, let's have your champion come out and fight our champion, which would be me, and then, you know, whoever wins, that's the side that will have dominance over the other. Well, who, who's supposed to be leading Israel out to battle? Who is supposed to be out fighting the champion? Who is Israel's great and mighty and tall champion that had been chosen for exactly that purpose? Was it not Saul? And yet Saul cowers behind the, well, behind the battle lines and tries to bribe somebody else to doing it for him and say, you know, well, I'll exempt you from taxes if you, uh, if you would just go out and fight the giant and defeat him. Saul, the head and shoulders above the rest in Israel, is now intimidated by somebody taller than he is because he sees simply as man sees. But David, on the other hand, sees the truth of the matter. He sees that it doesn't really matter who goes out and fights the giant. It doesn't really matter how tall that person is or how militarily capable that person is. The giant's going to fall because he's blaspheming the armies of the Most High God. And so, David, being the apparently not quite so tall fellow that he was, takes some stones and slings them at the giant's head and he kills the giant with nothing more than stones and the giant's own sword. That's, well, that's a, that, that creates a conflict right there because Saul should have been the one to do this and David does it. This, of course, led to the great famous song that they were singing in Israel that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Of course, that's just a poetic device, you know, to increase the numbers from line to line. But Saul doesn't interpret it that way. Saul sees this as they're saying that David's better than me. They're saying that they've ascribed thousands to me and ten thousands to David. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And from that day onward, Saul was determined to do away with David, to kill David. Saul is behaving irrationally. Even when David is playing the harp in his presence, Saul attempts to pin him to the wall with a spear on more than one occasion. One could ask how Saul has slain his thousands when he continually misses David with the spear, but that's another question to deal with. And then whenever he can't get David with the spear, he tries to get David to fall in battle. He tries to get David to fight against the Philistines. Go out and kill 200 Philistines for the hand of my daughter, Michael, as your wife. Eventually, Jonathan, David's friend and Saul's son, warns David that it's time to flee. Saul is planning to kill him outright. And so David ends up where we first met him, in the wilderness. But this time he's not tending the sheep. He's tending an army. An army of followers that have gathered to him, discontented with the reign of Saul. Because David is in the wilderness, like Israel was once in the wilderness, David, some of David's most profound tests happen right there in the wilderness while he's fleeing from Saul. And particularly important is the two incidents in 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 26 where David is presented twice with an opportunity to kill Saul. In one instance, Saul walks into a cave to relieve himself, not knowing that David and his men are hiding in the same cave. David's men look at him and they go, This is the chance you've been waiting for, David. You know, God's delivered him into your hands. But David doesn't kill Saul. He cuts off part of his robe secretly. And then he comes out and reveals that he's done this and says, Saul, I've spared your life. I had the opportunity to kill you and I didn't. And, of course, this shames Saul into returning back to his house in peace. And then later on in 1 Samuel 26, the same thing. They come up on Saul and he's sleeping. You know, apparently the guard has fallen asleep as well. And one of David's... Uh, mighty men, Abishai, says to him, you know, let, let, we can kill him right here. We can just kill him in one stroke. He's sleeping. This is perfect.
perfect. God has delivered him into your hands. And David says, no. He says, I am not going to strike the Lord's anointed. I am not going to reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Maybe the day will come that the Lord will strike him. But I'm not going to be the one to do this. And he takes Saul's spear in his water jug, again to prove that I had an opportunity to kill you and I didn't. And to show David's act of being merciful towards Saul. As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him or his day will come that he dies or he will go out into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And that brings us to our text this morning. 1 Samuel 25, which happens right between those two parallel incidents. Happens right between the two chances that David has to kill Saul. But David took the moral high ground on those occasions and he didn't kill Saul. You read 1 Samuel 25 and we're... Well, let's read the chapter. Saul's not really in this chapter. It, at first glance, seems to be something almost disconnected. But it's really not. There's a lesson here, both for David and for us as well. Beginning in verse 1. Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him, and buried him at his house in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. He was a Calebite. That David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, Have a long life. Peace be to you. Peace be to your house. Peace be to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them. Nor have they missed anything all the days that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please, give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name. Then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. So I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know. So David's young men retraced their way and went back and they came and told him according to all these words. And David said to his men, Each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men went up behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day, all the time we were with them tending the sheep. Now therefore you know, well, know and consider what you should do. For evil is plotted against our master and against all his household. And he is such a worthless man that no one can speak of him. Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. She said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain. Behold, David and his men were coming down to her. So she met them. And David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. He has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. 
Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you, to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the, life, in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, he will sling them out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord according to all the good that He has spoken concerning you and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged Himself. When the Lord deals well with my Lord, remember your maidservant. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light, as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him, and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within them, so that he became as a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. And when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David has sent us to take you as his wife. She arose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly arose and rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David had also taken a Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had taken Michael, his daughter, David's wife, uh, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galilee. Now this chapter begins with the death of Samuel, which you know, automatically seems to indicate that this is a major turning point in the book. Samuel was, as I said before, one of the three most important characters. He's the guy that the book is named after. Uh, which, I mean, the fact that he dies here in chapter 25 probably means he didn't write the whole thing of 1 Samuel. And he probably didn't write 2 Samuel either, since that's well after the fact. Uh, but Samuel's death is significant. It means that Saul and David have both lost an important mentor figure, a father figure of sorts to them. It also means that Israel has lost their last judge. They've lost their great spiritual guidance. It also serves to underscore how important this chapter is. The characters are introduced in verses 2 and through 4. We have Nabal. Nabal's a very wealthy man. In fact, he's so wealthy that his possessions are described before we were even given his name. Uh, he has 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, comparable to the kind of wealth that Job had. The name Nabal, though, well, Nabal's not a very nice thing to name your child. It means fool. And uh, his character is described as harsh and evil. He's called a Calebite, but that can also be translated like his heart, which is a subtle play on Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Um, now, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, why would a parent name their child fool? Uh, some people have said, well, that's not his real name. Uh, well, it's more likely, you know, parents name their children all sorts of stupid things. You know, I mean, you could just look through a phone book or a directory or anything like that. Right, true story, there's a guy who named his, he named one of his sons Winner. He named another son Loser. Don't know why somebody would do that. Winner went on to become a career criminal. He's got a, a over 30 arrests or something like that. Loser became a New York police detective and they call him Lou. True story. But it shows us that the ridiculous things people will name their children. Now, Nabal, 
Nabal means fool. Uh, you know, did it come to mean that because of the story? I don't know, but uh, it, it's interesting that he's called that. Abigail, on the other hand, is the opposite. Her name means my father is joy. And she is described as both intelligent and beautiful in appearance. She is, as you know, somebody I know once described it, the complete package, quote unquote. And you know, it's, you couldn't find more, two more opposite people to get married to each other than Nabal and Abigail. And then David start, interacts and, well, their whole world comes crashing down around them in some ways. David's been protecting Nabal's sheep shearers. And that's no easy task because shearing sheep is a time-consuming process. They've got over 3,000 sheep to deal with, especially. And David says, you know, I've been protecting your servants. I've been protecting them from outside dangers, you know, maybe wild animals and other things. David has gone and upgraded, apparently, from being a shepherd of sheep to being a shepherd of shepherds, a position in which he will ultimately rise up to shepherd the people of God in Israel. And David says to Nabal, ask ye your servants. Let them tell you, I've been protecting your guys. Well, in response, David simply asks whatever food Nabal has on hand. Now some people read that and they say, well David's running a protection racket. You know, he's doing favors that Nabal hasn't asked for and demanding things in return. You know, he's unfairly extorting Nabal. But at the time, you know, we got to understand things in light of their culture. This was considered acceptable hospitality. Um, you know, earlier in chapter 21, David had gone to the priests of Nabal and he'd made a similar re not the priests of Nabal, the priests of Nob had made a similar request, asking them for bread. David hadn't even done them any favors, and they still helped him out. But Nabal, after all that David has done to protect him, Nabal returns him evil for good. Nabal says, absolutely not. He insults David. He refers to him as just another servant, breaking away from his master. Ironically, Nabal is about to become a master whose servants break away from him. Nabal refuses him provision. I will not give you my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers. There's just a little bit too much emphasis on first person pronouns here. Like the rich fool of Luke 12, the fool Nabal, is putting a little too much emphasis on self. His focus is entirely on the I and the me and the mine. Now you might say, well, but he's providing it for his shearers, right? Except that later on in the chapter, what we see is that Nabal is actually not feeding his shearers, but himself. He's feasting like a king. Nabal is only concerned with his self-interest. His actions betray even the subtlest attempt to make himself look less than he, well, less selfish than he is. David doesn't take this well. David says, let's gird on our swords. David's about to make a huge mistake here. He doesn't inquire of God like he's done elsewhere in, say, 1 Samuel 23, for instance. David has been insulted. He plans to destroy Nabal's household. He will not leave, literally the idiom is, you know, anyone who urinates against the wall until morning, uh, you know, most versions translate it males. Um, in verse 22, the Septuagint actually makes David's vow harsher. May God do so to David, and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of anyone who belongs to him. Which you know, suggests that there is a... You know, David's making a foolish vow, calling down a curse, so that he can kill this man for making a petty insult against him. The Nabal's servants know what's coming. They know that their master has just behaved quite foolishly. And so they break away from their master, as Nabal remarked David was doing. And they go to Abigail and they testify of David's greatness. They say that you know, everything this man said was true. He was protecting us. His men were like a wall to us. They were protecting us in the wilderness day and night. David shouldn't have been turned out for this. Our master has behaved foolishly and irrationally. Fits with what David said earlier. Ask your servants and they will tell you in verse 8. I think it's interesting that, David, that Nabal's servants call him a worthless man, literally a son of Belial. Uh, that's an expression that appears elsewhere in Samuel, used of Eli's sons who are worthless men. Worthless men in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 27 who refused to give Saul a present upon his coronation. A worthless man later is introduced in 2 Samuel 20 named Sheba who wants to overthrow the reign of David. It's not a nice thing to say about someone. to call them a son of Belial. I say, nobody can talk to him. Nobody can talk to your husband. Let's see, do something about this, Abigail. So Abigail does do something. She intercedes on her husband's behalf. 
She gets a large contingent of gifts together, showing that Nabal apparently did have quite a bit on hand. You just look at the long list of stuff she gets in verse 18. Abigail does not inform her husband. She waits until later to do this. And at any rate, he probably would have tried to stop her. As his servant said, no one can speak to him. And she meets David, and the reader is reminded in verses 20-22 through 22 that David had vowed to destroy everybody in Nabal's house. And then Abigail gives her speech, and her speech is quite a masterpiece in this book. She takes the blame for Nabal's behavior twice in verses 24 and 28, even though she hadn't done anything wrong. You know, you might think of Daniel and his prayer in Daniel 9. How Daniel, you know, prayed, we have sinned, we have broken the covenant, we have committed this idolatry, we've done all this. And Daniel hadn't done any of those things. But he nevertheless, in a moment of pleading with God, you know, takes the blame upon himself. That's what Abigail's doing here with David. She takes the blame upon herself. She calls Nabal... A she calls Nabal a fool. She makes a little pun on his name. He is Nabal is his name, and Navala or Fali is with him. Um, she offers David the gift. In verses 26 and 29, she twice calls down judgment on David's enemies, which is interesting. Now, of course, immediately in the context of the book, who's David's enemy? Well, Nabal, right? But in the context of the whole book, who's David's real enemy? Who's been chasing him? Who was the reason David's in the wilderness in the first place? Well, Saul. And so the judgment she calls down on Nabal isn't, doesn't stop at Nabal. It extends to a man like Saul as well. In fact, we might say that Nabal is like a miniature version of Saul in this story. Because his role is basically the same. He's an enemy of David's who deserves to die, but who should not be killed by David's hand. Because that's something that the Lord has reserved for himself. She assumes throughout the speech that David will listen to restraint. The Lord has restrained you, she says in verse 26. In verses 30 and 31, she says, When the Lord has done all the good concerning you, then this guilt of, in, of bloodshed without cause is not going to be a problem for you. David, you're not going to have this hanging over your head when you become king. And for that matter, her whole speech assumes that yes, David will be king. God will, and furthermore, not only will David be the king of Israel, but God will establish an enduring house for David. Now this is the first time, you think about the impact of this. This is the first time in the Bible that anybody has spoken of David having an enduring house. There's a promise in 2 Samuel 7 that Nathan gives to David that can fleshes this idea out more that David will have an enduring house. But Abigail said it first. There is a sense then in which Abigail's words are prophetic. She speaks of a promise before even Nathan the prophet does. The rabbis believed, based on this passage, that Nabal was one of the seven women in the Old Testament who had the Spirit of God. David will be king. God will establish an enduring house for him. But more critical than that even, David says to Abigail, that blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. David recognizes that Abigail was sent by God. Blessed be your discernment. Blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. The Lord is the avenger. It's not our job to take vengeance for ourselves. Abigail's actions are used interchangeably with the actions of the Lord because the Lord is acting through Abigail to restrain David. David had been planning to kill every single member of Nabal's household by morning. But Abigail's wise words had restrained him. And without Nabal knowing it, Abigail had saved his, saved his skin. For now, anyway. And then we come home to Nabal. He's feasting like a king. He's, his heart is merry with wine. And then the next morning his heart dies when his wife tells him the news. And God strikes Nabal in verse 38 and he dies. One of the few individual people in the Old Testament that God is specifically singles out and it says that God killed them along with Saul, Jeroboam, and Jehoram. Not great company to be among in the Bible. Um, the Lord struck him. But David did not need to strike him. And the story ends with David taking Abigail as a wife. Now David has learned the lesson from this story by the time we get to chapter 26. 
Because he says words that sound quite familiar about Saul in verses 9 and 10. Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also says, as the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come that he dies, or he will go down into battle and perish. He's talking about Saul here. Well, David just saw that applied in real life to Nabal. What else can we learn about this? On the one hand, this story in 1 Samuel 25 shows us the near fatal mistake of David. David has been taking the moral high ground of not killing Saul, of not stretching his hand out against the Lord's anointed. He has done so well up to this point, and right in the middle, he almost does something that would have given him guilt of having shed blood without cause. David almost murders a man and his family for far less than Saul has done. Did Nabal deserve to die? Well, God killed him, so you would assume so. Some, fool, some people are fools. Some people have it coming to them. Saul has it coming to him. But was it David's job to take matters into his own hands? Was it David's job to decide who lives and who dies? No. It's David's job to leave that up to the arbiter of true justice, the Lord of hosts, because the judge of all the earth will deal rightly. But not only does this story show us a near fatal attempt, a near fatal mistake of David, it also shows us something else. Why David is a man after God's own heart. David's not perfect. Nobody can argue that he was. In fact, this story is ominously foreshadowing something that happens later on in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You know, in this instance, David takes the widow of a man that God killed for offending him, but later on, David takes the widow of a man that he killed for doing nothing but get in the way. You know, in the story of David and Bathsheba and Uriah. How could David be a man after God's own heart? He broke at least five of the Ten Commandments. Well, the emphasis is not on David's moral perfection. The, David is, the emphasis is on David's ability to acknowledge his sin. On his ability to learn from his mistakes. The fact that Abigail was even able to restrain David is itself what separates him from men like Saul. There's a similar incident where Saul is, he gets mad at the priests of Nob. You help David. You know, got far less reason to kill them. And Saul orders the priests of Nob to be put to death. And Saul's servants say, no, we don't want to do this. And Saul says, we're going to do it anyway. And he has Doeg the Edomite do it. Saul won't listen to reason. Saul won't listen to common sense when it comes to striking down the priests of the Most High God. But what about David? Well, Nabal was far more deserving of death than the priests, but David is still able to be restrained by the wise words of Abigail. Where Saul was unrestrainable and unreasonable, Abigail was able to turn David from wrongdoing. Where Saul made excuses and protested innocence, David was able to simply confess to sin. Whenever Samuel confronted Saul about not destroying the Amalekites, Saul was you know, making every excuse in the world, only admitting sin when it finally realized what it would cost him. But when Nathan confronted David over the issue of Bathsheba, David simply confessed, I have sinned. He made no attempt to defend himself. He made no attempt to justify or rationalize his actions. He simply saw himself for what he was. He was imperfect, a wretched sinner in the sight of God, like so many of us. The humility of David in his heart made him the better man. The humility in his heart made him the man after God's own heart. There's a lesson about Jesus in this story as well. How many of us would reply to insults the way David did? Or how many of us would like to reply to insults the way David did, you know? We do something for somebody and they spit on our charity. You know, let's round up our friends and, you know, go kill them, right? Well, um, we can't do that. Society would punish us for that kind of behavior. Well, how many of us would like to respond to insults another way? You know, I like to respond to insults with snappy comebacks and, you know, let's really put this fool in our place with our sharp tongue and our ready wit, right? You know, that's the way I like to deal with it. Is that the way you like to deal with it? Is that the way we should deal with it, though? We like to see a fool answered according to his folly. We like to see a guy get his just desserts. But what about Jesus? 
in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 19 through 25. It says the following about our Lord. That this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. While being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin, and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Powerful words. Jesus had far more reason than David even did to respond to insults. And Jesus had far more power than David did. David had an army of 600 men. Jesus could have summoned an army of 12 legions of angels at his disposal to come and eliminate these people who were so unjustly oppressing him. But Jesus didn't do any of those things because Jesus had a greater purpose in mind. So who are we like? Who would take out your songbooks as we conclude the lesson this morning? Hmm. Whenever we read a story like this, you have to ask ourselves the question, who are we like? Are we like Nabal? Are we a fool? Well, if we can admit that we're like Nabal, we're probably less like him than... You know, than he is. Because nobody could reason with Nabal. Nobody could get him to see his folly. That's why God destroyed him. Are we like David? Some of us might be like David. We need somebody to restrain us once in a while. We have our fatal flaws. We occasionally do pig headed things that. But if we're content to be like David, well, then we're probably not that much like David, are we? Because David strove to be better than he was. Are we like Abigail? We all wish we could be like Abigail. Her wisdom, her insight, her humility. In many ways, in many ways she typifies Christ in this story. Are we like Jesus? Jesus who did not see the need to open his mouth at insults. And there was never a person on the earth who was less deserving of insults and more deserving of praise than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yet he endured it all for us. In the same way, the love and the humility of Christ ought to restrain all of us from wrongdoing, those of us who listen. So look at your life. Look at the way you live. Are you acting according to folly? The love of Christ compels you and controls you to change that way of thinking. Change your life. If there's anything we can do, if we can put you in a right relationship with God through baptism this morning or through any other means, now will be an appropriate time. Make it known. All together we stand and we sing the song selected.